Okay, it's recording. It's recording. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, it doesn't look like we had it. Sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I'll start, I'll introduce myself. I, my name is Leela. I'm an M1 and I'm president of our graduate chapter of AMSA. AMSA is the American Medical Student Association for those that don't know. Kat, you wanna go? Sure. Um, so hi, my name is Katarina or I go by Kat. I'm also an M1 and I'm the vice president of the graduate chapter of AMSA. Hello, my name is Tariq Pinnock and I'm a M1 also, and I'm the secretary of the graduate chapter of AMSA. Uh, my name is Shavam and I'm an M1 as well, and I'm the treasurer of the graduate chapter of AMSA. <laughs> I think we should have some, I think we do actually have some um, students from the undergraduate chapter joining us here too. Um, so we, we have some really amazing guests, all Sophie Davis alumni to share with us their experiences with advocacy and just about their medical practice. Um, so we're each gonna introduce um, one of the alumni and have them speak a little bit about their practice and advocacy efforts. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a Q and A um, discussion with questions that we have prepared and also that you've all sent in. And if you have additional questions, we'd love to hear them. Um, so I'll start off by introducing Dr. Santiago. Um, Dr. Santiago attended Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education from 1984 to 1989. He received his Bachelor of Science degree at City College in New York and his MD from State University of New York at Stony Brook Medical School. He completed his residency in family practice at the University of Medicine and Dentistry at the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And he became board certified in family practice in 1994. Dr. Santiago joined the Care Resource Community Health Centers in Miami, Florida in 1998. In addition to providing primary care services to its many underserved and minority patients, he directed the research program and functioned as principal investigator for numerous pharmaceutical and government-based, government-sponsored HIV-related clinical trials. From 2003 to 2014, Dr. Santiago held the position of medical director and subsequently was appointed to chief medical officer. He currently oversees all clinical services at the center's four locations, including medical, dental, and behavioral health services. Dr. Santiago has been an active member of the HIV treatment and prevention education community nationally, speaking frequently on numerous topics to underserved patient groups and physicians and allied health professionals. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Santiago. Um, would you mind telling thank us a little, a little bit more about your practice and some of your advocacy efforts? Yeah, sure. So I, I moved down uh, to Miami in 1994, right after finishing residency, um, to get away from the cold. <laughs> so I'm, I've been very happy down here. Um, I'm originally from New York City. Uh, my parents are Puerto Rican, um, and uh, I wanted to be someplace closer to the Caribbean. And I also wanted to be someplace where I, I can uh, I could work with. Uh, the minority population of Miami. So about uh, half of our patients uh, at uh, work are um, Hispanic uh, or black. So a uh, large number of uh, minorities. And in addition, um, we uh, originally uh, were an AIDS service organization. So about 98% of our patients were HIV positive. Um, however, uh, in 1999, we became a, a federally qualified health center and uh, so we expanded uh, our, our scope to, to uh, patients at risk uh, and, and the, you know, sorry, my cat sometimes will distract me <laughs> so, as he tries to, you know, buy for attention. Um, so uh, then we expanded to, to other uh, patient groups. So about 35% uh, of our patients now are HIV positive. So that means that the rest are at risk. Uh, we opened uh, a clinic in uh, Little Havana a couple of years ago, and it's now one of our busiest clinics. We take care of uh, a lot of undocumented women and their children at that clinic. So uh, really the, the work that we do um, is very much in line with, with what I studied. You know, I was, uh, um, you know, very much into community health when I studied at, at uh, Sophie Davis, and uh, you know it's, it's really thrilling to be able to 
to uh, to work in in a community health center now. Uh, we have about 15,000 patients, so we have uh, lots of, lots of patients, and uh, we do a lot of uh, good good work in the community. Uh, we got the COVID vaccine last week, so uh, we you know we've been yeah yeah we've been going crazy trying to uh, implement that. We're hoping to finish uh, the first batch of a thousand doses that we got by the end of this week. So hopefully we'll get uh, some more. <laughs> so uh, uh, as I said, you know, we were an aid service organization. So a lot of the work that I did for many years, uh, you know, revolved around HIV uh, prevention and treatment. Um, and uh, as, as you know, Miami is, is one of the epicenters for HIV in the United States. And we still have a lot of new cases, especially among um, uh, young uh, Hispanic uh, men who have sex with men. Uh, so we're still growing in, in that group in Miami, although nationally that we know there is a trend down in HIV cases. Um, and then in 2013, we started doing PrEP. So a lot of uh, work uh, in the community around uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And of course we do uh, post non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. So um, I do frequent lecturing, lecturing to the community um, it's for, with regards to prevention and treatment. I, I love talking to patients. Uh, uh, I, I talk to professionals as well, but it, to me, it's more fulfilling uh, to talk to patient groups. They really appreciate the time. You know, oftentimes they don't have time to ask questions to their healthcare provider. You know, I certainly know, you know, I'm, I'm busy when I see my patients. I still see patients about uh, one full day a week. Um, and it's usually pretty busy. So I understand when patients say that they don't have time to really ask their, their uh, healthcare providers all sorts of questions. Um, I was involved with the American Medical Student Association chapter when I was at Sophie Davis. So, so I was really thrilled to find out uh, that, uh, that this is what I was uh, participating in today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think next is Dr. Shaw. So Sharon, I think is gonna. Sure. Uh, so Great. thank you, Dr. Santiago. Uh, so next we have Dr. Ami Shah. So Dr. Ami Shah is the Director of Mammography at New York City Health and Hospital Corporation Hospital, whose mission it is to serve the underserved and provide compassionate quality health care, regardless of the person's ability to pay. Uh, she graduated from Sophie Davis in 1992 and earned a perfect average and was awarded summa cum laude and a Dean's Award of Academic Excellence and Human Compassion. And as a student, she served as Sophie Davis's chapter president of the American Medical Student Association and as the chapter president of Amnesty International for the City College of New York. Uh, Dr. Shah did her residency at New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center and mammography training during a fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Having held many leadership roles during her career, she is now the delegate for the American Medical Association and has served on the women's physician section for eight years and now on the radiology section council as a delegate for the American College of Radiology. She also serves on the alumni board of Stony Brook School of Medicine, where she graduated in 1994 with the Marvin Kushner Award for Academic Excellence and Human Compassion and was also inducted as a member of the Alpha Omega Alpha, the Honor Society in the field of medicine. She is also extensively involved in her hospital where she serves on the medical executive community. Her motto is to continue to learn, grow, solve, and improve. So here's Dr. Amish. <laughs> Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm, I'm also honored, as Dr. Santiago said, to be invited by uh, the board of the American Medical Student Association chapter of Sophie Davis. Um, as you mentioned, I was also uh, a member of it and then sub subsequently became uh, president of the local chapter. And I, I think that's really where I got uh, my start with uh, advocacy. Um, the reason why AMSO is so special to me is uh, every month we had uh, wonderful um, topics locally, but we also uh, went to regional and national meetings with AMSO, which I hope all of you are doing. And it just made me realize how big the world of medicine um, is. And although it's very important to, to learn what we learn in the classroom, uh, for me, it was very important to learn the larger role and how I fit in uh, to shaping uh, the field of medicine. Uh, 
I, I learned so much as part of AMSA and whenever I learned something, I, I would try and write an article for the biograph. I don't know if you still have a, a newspaper called the biograph, but that was our student uh, newspaper. And, um, and then when I uh, finished uh, and became a radiologist, uh, I uh, continued to want to seek ways in which we can effect a change. Uh, okay, so the biograph recently started again. That's great, thanks for that message. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sure all of you have filled out your essays on why you wanted to go into medical school. And I'll just share with you one of my stories is uh, um, when uh, I was delivered in Bombay, it was by a female physician who also had a, a clinic that she offered care to people free of cost. And every time I would go back and visit India, which is where I was born, my parents would always take my sister and myself to that clinic. And we greatly admired that physician. And I think I held on to that, um, that uh, idea of import, the importance of serving the underserved community. So currently, um, as, I, as you mentioned, I work for one of the city hospitals, which serves underserved women. And in the past 10 years, I've also been involved with the American Medical Association. And uh, I would say I had two uh, major uh, involvement. One is the women's physician section, uh, which uh, is a, a large part of the American Medical Association. And uh, having been part of their uh, section, I represented 90,000 female physicians. And so we had done all kinds of things. It's, it's a great forum for networking, uh, for leadership uh, development, uh, for mentoring. Uh, we also monitored trends uh, that were impacting both women in medicine as well as healthcare needs of female uh, of females, uh, women and children. Uh, some of the things that we have addressed over the past 10 years are payment disparities between uh, uh, men and women, uh, the Me Too, uh, movement and the, uh, and the impact on medical students and in, in, uh, in training uh, for physicians, um, breaking the glass ceiling, uh, issues such as uh, uh, maternity and uh, paternity leave policies during your training as a medical student, as a resident. So that's, that's one part of it as a, a physician practicing in medicine. And then the second part is uh, also advocating for our patients. So I'm a mammographer. Uh, and so what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is, is attempt to diagnose breast cancer. And so in advocating for my patients, some of the things I've been able to uh, give my voice to as a part of the Medical, Me uh, Medical Association and the American College of Radiology is significant changes that have happened um, over the past 10 years. And I'll just uh, talk to you about some of the things that I've been involved with that I, that I think it's amazing that as a, a physician practicing in New York, that we can contribute to something, you know, that changes the way uh, healthcare is in, in our entire country. Some of the things the, that the AMA has taken a, a lead on, uh, as I said, is the transparency and the maternity and paternity leave policy but also as a mammographer, uh, they advocated for uh, having mammograms paid for on an annual basis, uh, payment for ultrasound for dense breast screening, um, advocating for no female tax. I don't know if you recall, but in New York State previously, they used to tax female products such as pads and things like that. And the AMA uh, saw that as a disparity and came out against taxing uh, female hygiene products. Um, things such as payment for breast reduction surgery um, when it's medically necessary, not for cosmetic re reasons. So all of those things um, that currently exist, you know, they've, they've happened uh, over a lot of advocacy uh, uh, through, the, for me uh, anyway, through the American College of Radiology and the American Medical Association. And as someone who's a, a leader uh, for um, uh, Breast, uh, breast cancer and diseases of the breast, for me, it's very important to be part of the solution, to learn the problems and to be a part of the solution. So um, that's kind of where my journey has been. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm also involved in my hospital because I think it's important uh, to stay involved with the organization, to help lead the organization. Um, uh, to me, it, it's just, it's been a very rewarding uh, and appealing because it gives me an opportunity to learn. It gives me an opportunity to network uh, and to uh, continue to improve things both for women in medicine and for our patients. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Shaw, for sharing. So next we will move on to Dr. Roman Gis. So Dr. Roman Gis is an assistant professor of pediatrics and the director for pediatric critical care medicine at SUNY Downstate Medical Sciences University. He obtained his bachelor of science in biomedical sciences in 2004 from the Sophie Davis School for Biomedical Education and his, and his doctorate in medicine from Stony Brook School of Medicine in 2006. He completed his residency training in general pediatrics at Cohen Children's Medical Center in 2009 and his fellowship training in pediatric critical care medicine at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Well Cornell Medical Center in 2012. Always making it a priority to give back to his local community, Dr. Gis currently serves as clinical director for the Kings Against Violence Initiative which is a hospital and community-based violence intervention and prevention program located in Brooklyn, New York. Welcome, Dr. Gis. Thank you so much for that introduction, and I'm so grateful for being uh, invited to speak uh, to this awesome group of students and uh, former students as well. So, I like to start out by saying that you know advocacy is not just something that starts you know when you're in attending, but really you can look at advocacy as something that you can do uh, from your time at Sophie uh, as a med student and even as a resident and attending. And I think that uh, sometimes people look at it as something that you do after you're done. So for me, advocacy started when I was in Sophie. Uh, I started by you know volunteering as a tutor at my, at my church, um, as well as being a big sib as well. And even working in the childhood center over on the CUNY campus. Uh, that was how I started out as a student. As a, as a resident, um, I actually formed a relationship with a local high school for our program's advocacy rotation. And so that pediatricians in training at the hospital could actually start to understand the community that, that they were serving. Sometimes as physicians, you know, we operate in this silo in the hospital where, you know, we see patients, you know, they come in and they leave, or they come to our clinics and they come in and they leave and you may see them, you know, on a yearly basis, or you may see them for sick visits. But if you don't really understand the life that your patients live and their personal uh, obstacles and the various psychosocial determinants of health outcomes, it's very difficult to understand um, your patient. So that was important for residents to understand. Um, when I was a, a fellow at Cornell, uh, I served as an elder in a rites of passage program right in Harlem at the Abyssinian Baptist Church uh, for young men who were going through rites of passage. And then as an attending at, at Downstate, you know, I, I, while I love ICU medicine and it's definitely my passion as a clinician, you know, it was an amazing opportunity to be able to return uh, to my community. I grew up in Flatbush, Brooklyn, and that's where Downstate is located. And uh, a buddy of mine said, hey, this is a program at Downstate. So when you go there, look out for it and see if you can, if you can join. So after being there for some time, uh, I ended up meeting Dr. Rob Gore, who found the Kavi uh, in 2009. And I started out as, you know, as a volunteer, and this is me as an attendant. So you know, I volunteered for a few years, and then gradually, as we sought to increase our academic partnerships with Downstate, um, I became the clinical director uh, two years ago. And <clears throat> at Kavi, what we do is we help people who are in the hospital that are victims of gunshots, assaults, or stabbings, um, we provide uh, these participants of care with wraparound services. And so we see them through the whole process of care, through the time in the ED, or if they're in the ICU, or if they're in the trauma clinic or the behavioral health clinic. Uh, we provide them with wraparound services and longitudinal follow-up. We also have a school program in which we 
um, go into local schools in the community. Uh, right now we're in three schools and we meet with students um, about twice a week and we discuss various topics. So it could be what's going on in music or what's going on in their personal lives. But we always have a curriculum base that we follow um, so that we have objective learning points that we want to impart upon the students. However, we still provide them a space for them to be safe and to be free. And we have certain principles that we follow within um, our model. We practice trauma-informed care. We use credible messengers, all right? And we believe in restorative justice. And we do lots of these trainings uh, in our hospital with residents, with nurses, with hospital police, and also in the school because it's the cycle of traumatization of patients and also students and communities of, of color uh, is quite rampant. And so our goal in Kavi is to help change community norms and see how we can create a safer Brooklyn. Um, I'll stop there so we can have more of a dialogue and time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gist, for sharing your, st your story. And now we will go lastly to Dr. Linda Alvarez. I have a little um, intro here for her. Dr. Linda Alvarez completed her studies at Sophie Davis in 2012 and in her MD at New York Medical College in 2015. She matched to family medicine residency at Jackson Memorial Hospital and continued on to hospice palliative fellowship afterwards. She is currently in graduate school earning an executive MBA from the Cornell Johnson School of Management. While in training, Dr. Alvarez took an active role in the Committee of Interns and Residents beginning in the intern year of her residency through completion of her Hospice Palliative Fellowship in 2019, working her way up in the organization from Family Medicine Representative to Hospital Delegate to, Flor to Florida Regional Vice President and Field Organizer. For her dedication to improving healthcare access to patients at Jackson Memorial Hospital, she was nominated Resident of the Year for the State of Florida in 2018. She was sworn in as National Secretary Treasurer in May 2019, taking on a dual role as organizing strategist in which she worked across the country to help with new organizing campaigns, collective bargaining, in hospital contract negotiations, as well as new membership campaigns, member retainment, and leadership and development. She also began to work on political activism and as a spokeswoman for national campaigns, including leading the charge on the first National Residence Bill of Rights. For her advocacy work, Dr. Alvarez was acknowledged in 2020 as one of the top 100 healthcare leaders by the International Forum on Healthcare Advancements. She's currently consulting on advocacy and strategy campaigns for medical equity-based organizations. She has been a brand ambassador of the Urban Yoga Foundations since 2013, a relationship that began while she was at Sophie Davis and continues to the present. In this role, she's continued the vision and movement of work to help empower underserved communities through yoga and meditation. She also continues to serve as strategic planning and advisory board member of the foundation, assisting with the development of clear strategic campaigns, as well as forging partnerships with regional and national organizations to broaden the foundation's impact. Thank you so much, Katerina, and thank you all for having me. Um, I am very humbled to be among the group of alumni that you chose to have speak, um, especially hearing everybody speak before me. Um, I was really moved and also it rekindled a lot of what got me excited about advocacy. Um, and to your point, Dr. Gist, it really started in Sophie Davis. Um, Sophie Davis really ignited my passion for advocacy and really ignited my really striving to help the underserved and underserved communities. Um, to Dr. Shah's point, I was an editor of the Biograph and actually throughout my time at Sophie Davis, I published different political advocacy and medically based articles online um, to really get my, my standing um, in medical advocacy. I was also a very active member of AMSA and got to go to quite a few of the national conferences and understand um, what the field of medicine was outside of our amazing Sophie Davis bubble. Um, when I left Sophie Davis, I actually took a year of independent study um, to pursue yoga, meditation, um, as well as traditional Indian medicine. 
um, simultaneously launching the Urban Yoga Foundation with one of my mentors. Um, we are a 501c3 organization, and through that year, we were able to be in 17 New York City public schools um, providing yoga and meditation services to kids and their families, um, as well as partners, partnering with the Abyssinian Church, uh, Dr. Jess, um, different community members throughout Harlem, uh, the National Guard, American Heart Association, um, and American Autism. And through that, we've actually been able to train over 250 practitioners in urban kids yoga, which is a form of yoga meant to empower um, our youth that are normally underserved and not really given that chance or that voice. Um, I went to Miami to do my residency. I'm half Cuban and I really wanted to feel that connection in serving um, a lot of the Latino community members there. Um, and through that time, we endured the Trump presidency. Um, it was the first time I had ever been in a state that wasn't blue. And I didn't know that working at a public hospital system where the funds were controlled by the state, I couldn't really be vocal about my political views. We had, um, at that time, my patient panel had at least 80% Latino with 60% of them primarily only, only speaking Spanish, um, as well as many um, were undocumented and just felt unsafe after the Trump election. I lost approximately 35% of my patient population because they felt so unsafe to come and see me. I had kicked ice out of our hospital systems multiple times. Um, and that really is what activated me to be a member of the union because I couldn't say that those patients were welcome in our hospital because it would affect the funding. And so instead, I took a much more political approach um, and was very vocal on the side of the resident physician union. Um, over that time, um, I ended up becoming national uh, executive secretary treasurer. And I spearheaded a lot of the political and resident-led campaigns. Um, I was very lucky too that it was during a very busy political year. And so we were able to get attention and garner support on issues, especially like the Resident Bill of Rights, um, different COVID issues that arose throughout the spring, summer, and winter um, with actual presidential candidates and people who have positions of power now who acknowledge what residents have been saying on the ground. Um, I also had the pleasure of getting to lead um, over 200 medical professionals and physicians to uh, CBP headquarters in San Ysidro, California when they were refusing to allow us to vaccinate um, the, uh, the immigrants that were detained. And so that actually resulted in national news coverage. We had uh, four physicians that were arrested. Um, and so I mitigated that um, situation. Um, as uh, Katerina had mentioned, I spearheaded the resident bill of rights. Um, I am happy and more than happy to talk to any of you off of this chat about what it means to be a resident, what your rights are as an employee and how you can safely fight for them. Um, there are some states where you can't and you can actually have issues in terms of um, being let go. And so we developed the Resident Bill of Rights and actually have it endorsed by President-elect Joe Biden, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Andrew Yang, um, with multiple uh, state uh, legislations as well supporting it. And so uh, we're trying to bring the issues of medical students and residents to light. Um, I finished my term as national uh, secretary treasurer in November. Um, and actually now what I've been doing full time is uh, consulting work for different startup based medical equity companies. Um, a lot, there's a lot of technology coming out that actually is to help the patient and get access to care, especially in our underserved communities. And these, um, these entrepreneurs, these people that are just starting out their businesses, it's a lot of different grad students, helping them hone into what are the core values that are important to physicians and our patients and how do you work within the medical system to ensure that you're giving care. And so I have a little bit of a different uh, clinical background, but I'm happy to share all of that and to really inspire you guys to find what you are passionate about. Um, as you heard from the four of us, advocacy is different to each of us. 
And everybody on this call has a different meaning of what advocacy means to them. And so find what you are passionate about, what really, really interests you and go running with it. Um, so that's, that's me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Alvarez for your story as well. And as Leela had mentioned in the beginning, we will be having a Q&A session. So we do have a list of questions that we have sort of prepared in addition to the questions that you guys have given to us. And so um, if it's okay, Tariq, will you begin with the first question that we have? Yes, okay. Thank you all for sharing your experiences and your work. So as we know, as we've all experienced, 2020 was a hectic year. So I would like to pose a question to all of our panelists today. Um, how has the pandemic and any social events affected your population specifically? Starting with anyone, actually, anyone. Um, I, I'm happy to start. Uh, so, you know, as I said before, I'm a radiologist and director of mammography. So in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, mammography had to shut down uh, pretty much overnight. Um, any uh, non-essential healthcare in New York City, probably the entire state had to shut down uh, so that we could make room for, uh, um, for patients who are inflicted with um, the uh, COVID. And, and so for me as a leader in my hospital and as director of mammography, we had to decide um, how were we going to shut down? So we had to shut down screening mammography, diagnostic mammograms continue, patients with symptoms continue, all these kind of like um, minor, you know, uh, not minor, but major decisions, but that really affect patient care. Um, then once we were allowed to restart, we had to figure out how to uh, welcome patients back in, how to, how to make them feel safe. Uh, a lot of people had lost their jobs. A lot of people were afraid to come in all of these um, decisions that affect uh, people and all the things we learned uh, in Sophie Davis as, as part of the community health and social medicine, all the social determinants of healthcare, I think the pandemic has highlighted. Uh, and so it's very um, important for us to have that background from Sophie Davis. Um, and it, it was an excellent background to kind of help patients um, to understand what the patients were going through to help them come back and get the care. Of course, we also dealt with other things such as the medical student resident training um, had to change because now um, we couldn't be you know, close to each other. A lot of the radiology residents uh, and medical students were deployed to other areas outside of radiology. We had to uh, become creative and do virtual uh, virtual training. Um, there was uh, a PPE shortage and I worked extensively with the uh, American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin that I forgot to mention, but I've been a part of since I was a medical student, as well as with uh, the American Medical Association to figure out how we can advocate uh, to get PPE to, to uh, everybody because there was such a shortage uh, to create resources, to create a site for uh, knowledge uh, one of the exciting things I just want to, you know, also talk about some of the fun things I've done as become, uh, you know, as part of my advocacy is, for example, uh, during the uh, pandemic, um, I had the opportunity to work with both the uh, American Medical Association and the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin and kind of bring them together as part of a COVID-19 webinar series. I had met Dr. Jerome Adams, who's the Surgeon General of the United States of America, uh, during AMA meetings. And um, because of that relationship, I was able to invite him to the webinar. Also, the AMA trains you to have uh, leadership confidence and skills. So I reached out to Seema Verma, who's the administrator for the uh, CMS, which is uh, the Center for Medicare and Medical Services, which controls, I don't remember how much money, but like trillions of dollars of healthcare uh, money. Uh, we had uh, leaders from the AMA and, we, and um, I had uh, co-moderated a panel uh, and we talked about all the things that are affecting physicians, such as uh, payment for telemedicine, uh, state licensing issues. The New York state was in a crunch. We didn't have enough physicians. We needed physicians to come from all around the country. Well, you know what? Those are state licensing issues. How do we get a physician from another state who's not licensed in New York to come? Uh, what about the uh, medical malpractice and liability issues? Um, New York State was a leader 
in addressing uh, COVID liability protection for physicians who came to New York State to help and for physicians who are uh, dealing with treating patients for the first time. Uh, and so that was one of the exciting things to me is really being able to, as a leader within the AMA and API to talk to and bring um, amazing people such as Dr. Adams and uh, Seema Verma uh, to the other members of the organization. Um, I'm, I don't wanna keep uh, uh, talking, so I'm going to uh, hand over to Mike to one of the other uh, panelists, but feel free to come back and ask more questions. I did to your to your point, Dr. Shine. So it was interesting for me because I wasn't at that time I wasn't seeing patients. I was full time working as um, the secretary treasurer, and so I was responsible for eighteen thousand residents. Um, you know, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, D.C., uh, Florida, and all over California, and so we had a situation where. I mean, COVID blew up in, in New York and then had to kind of also deal with work that was happening in California. And how did we make sure that all of our residents had supplies, make sure that we counted um, the, um, the ABMS accountable and ACGME, making sure that residents who were getting placed on other rotations weren't going to get dinged and have to extend their residency, making sure that residents who were treating patients, especially early on in the pandemic, um, that they felt safe, that if they were testing or if they felt symptoms, that they would be able to get a test and to be able to go home. Um, there were so many different factors at, at play that we had to be very vocal about. Um, and to your point too, Dr. Shah had brought up, there were areas that needed help. Um, there were areas that needed more doctors. And so actually we had a situation where, um, I don't know if you guys are aware, but Trump instituted another travel ban in June. And that travel ban actually directly affected the J1 and H1B visas that it shouldn't have. Um, and so these were residents who are already already were told that they had a residency slot in the States, um, but they were coming from different countries um, and they were being denied access to their uh, country embassies. They weren't getting visas and the hospital systems had, in some cases, we helped bring over over 150 residents from around the world, um, but there were some hospital systems that were missing 60 residents. And so we actually joined in a joint lawsuit, um, a class action lawsuit against the Trump administration um, that I got to speak on about how this travel ban was um, in essence, not only hurting the national economy and the national health, um, but also each of these individual organizations that are trying to function and help our healthcare system. So uh, I'll take it from there. Um, so from my standpoint, I'll, I'll look at it from more of the, of the community aspect um, in East Flatbush and around the topic of gun violence. You know, uh, Central Brooklyn, um, our, our rates of gun violence been up exponentially with COVID. And as I mentioned before, we have a violence intervention and prevention program, but volunteer services were, were banned from hospitals because of the obvious concerns for acquiring COVID um, in the hospital. But what that meant is that all of these patients who were coming in with COVID were not received, sorry, with um, gunshots, assaults, and stabbings were not receiving services that could actually, you know, decrease episodes of retaliation, provide them with um, housing services, job services, all the things that were needed in this crisis. And the last one in particular was mental health services. So we did our best to transition to a virtual model, but we actually had to advocate, um, you know, with HHC to get us back in the hospital, uh, get, our, get our responders the proper training, access to PPE so we could actually provide on the ground support. Because while we're dealing with the pandemic of COVID-19, we also had a pandemic of violence um, in our communities that were affecting, that is affecting uh, black and brown uh, communities. So we had to advocate from, uh, from that standpoint. And so we're dealing with that on top of everything else uh, that we mentioned with uh, medical providers in those struggles with, with uh, COVID. So violence in the communities um, was a huge issue this summer. And then even thinking about like racial justice, right? How do we integrate racial justice into the curriculum for a SUNY downstate? And so our students really uh, took the lead in having protests, having a die-in and getting support of faculty to participate in that effort. 
So literally from the social justice and racial justice standpoint, um, COVID really um, affected many things and actually spurred people into action who maybe were inactive before or didn't see these issues as, as their issue. And now I think that with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and COVID, you know, focusing everyone's energy and attention to the screen, people now can see that racial justice is an issue for all of us, not just for one group of people. Okay, great, great. Um, wow, this, you, you guys picked a, a really wonderful group of alumni to, to participate tonight. This, is, this has been really um, enlightening and, and I'm really humbled to be in your, your uh, midst. Um, so I, at Care Resource in, in South Florida, of, of course, you know, uh, we've been pretty hard hit with uh, COVID uh, since the beginning. Uh, Miami is, is, has been the epicenter for Florida for, for COVID. And um, because we take care of still a lot of patients uh, that have HIV, um, you know, there was this big concern because we basically uh, switched over to telehealth uh, very early on. And so there was a concern that patients were gonna, were gonna be falling out of care and it was gonna affect, affect their, their HIV care. Uh, but fortunately, a few years ago, we started to do uh, medication assisted uh, treatment. So we have a very strong behavioral health department and we actually got a CDC grant um, uh, for for uh, providing uh, telehealth services to black uh, men who have sex with men uh, youth in order to improve uh, adherence and retention to care. So we were able to, to uh, have our behavioral health team basically overnight uh, train all of our uh, medical providers and, and, uh, and do uh, telehealth uh, for our medical patients. So, so that was really a, a, a blessing because uh, we were able to reach out and provide services. And actually we anticipate that moving forward, it's really gonna actually help our, our patients because uh, we've been able to retain uh, more patients and care than before. Uh, patients that normally would, would not be able to, to uh, come into the office because of work or family commitments uh, can now uh, uh, you know, uh, get services uh, more reliably. Uh, and uh, about, I would say, 60% uh, of our services right now are via telehealth. So a lot of patients continue to want to use uh, telehealth. And, and I, I see this as really something that's going to be good moving forward. Um, there, there is also, uh, we have a, a significant, significant number of patients, obviously, that are LGBT, um, that deal with a, a lot of history of trauma and mental health disorder. And uh, so COVID has really hit that population very hard. Uh, we have a lot of patients with PTSD. Um, and uh, so it, it, it's required a lot of handholding. Our behavioral health department has, has never been so busy uh, as they are right now uh, providing these services. Uh, some of them have even gotten burnt out. I'm sure you've heard about healthcare uh, providers getting burnt out during this pandemic. Um, it, 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 it's been a very trying time, but also very fulfilling. Um, and uh, I, I think we're very well positioned. We're seeing about as many patients now as we were before the pandemic. Um, and uh, it, it's really gratifying to be able to offer the vaccine. I actually was, was vaccinating myself today and the patients just are, are so, so happy and it's nice to be able to, to give them something good to, to look forward to. Thanks. Thank yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think Margaret asked the question in the chat about specifically for Dr. Santiago about how, um, what would you estimate as care resources patient impact per year or during COVID? Impact per year. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure exactly I understand um, that question. Um, so we, we, we have about 15,000 patients, about 30,000 uh, visits per year. Uh, and I would say that uh, it hasn't negatively impacted. Uh, we, you know, we are busier than before. We actually started offering COVID testing because we got $2 million in uh, federal money um, uh, to, to, to help our population during this pandemic. You know, federally qualified health centers are really uh, kind of at the core uh, uh, of being able to provide services to the underserved and minority populations. And we were able to use that money um, to provide free testing. And uh, a lot of those patients have, have decided to continue on with us as, as medical patients. Um, so uh, I, I'm not sure if I understood uh, the question correctly, but if, if I didn't answer, just let me know. 
Thank you so much for your response. And we're just going to be shifting gears a little bit in terms of the questions. We got one of the questions from our medical students asking, as a medical professional, sorry, how do you navigate advocating for controversial topics knowing that there is a hierarchy in medicine? And this is for all of our panelists. Anyone can say what they, what they have on the question. So I can take a stab at, at this one. Um, and the way that I look at it is this is your voice. Um, if there is something that you feel passionately about, you should be able to be vocal about it. Medicine is a very, very much so hierarchical. Um, I had quite a few friends too who um, I, I mentor um, some medical students who were going into residency um, as well as some residents who were going into fellowship. And they were concerned too about photos that they have of them at Black Lives Matter protests or what they were posting about that. And one of, one of my mentees said it really well in that she said that I don't want to go to a place that wouldn't accept me for wanting to stand for those beliefs. And that's I think that's really important and that's important for wherever you do residency and you go on and continue to work. You wanna be in an environment that, that supports you in that and really acknowledges that you as a physician have a strong voice, you have a pulse on your community um, and that that voice is powerful. I think something that is really important that I kept hearing in Sophie Davis and I didn't understand it until I left and that is the power of the white coat and your, your voice. Um, you have so much power in your voice and especially to with that white coat. Um, you make a difference in terms of, you're not only acknowledged in terms of how intellectual you are, how much you've persevered through your career, but it says something about your moral character. Um, that you are altruistic enough to want to give back to your community and really own that power that you have. And do not, you know, again, tread lightly in how you see fit, but be vocal and, and really voice your, your concerns. Again, too, safely and there are hierarchies, but their medicine is changing in a lot of ways. And Dr. Shatu, I know that you wanted to say something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to add on to what Dr. Alvarez eloquently stated is, um, you know, the power of your voice. I think uh, it was very important to be a part of AMSA as a medical student. And there are a lot of uh, uh, specialty society and organized medicine. Um, I, I just told you the three that I'm really involved with, American College of Radiology, because I'm a radiologist, American Medical Association, which is an umbrella organization and the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin because um, you know I was born in India, came to New York when I was five. So I identify with all these three organizations, but they have a very uh, large support for the medical student and their resident and the young physician um, chapters within these organizations. And, and your voice really matters. They really wanna know what you say. And a lot of times the medical students lead the change within these organizations. When I was a student at Sophie Davis, I could not identify myself in some of these organizations. And then I decided I need to be a part of these organizations to make it change in a direction that I want it to go. And just to give you, uh, you know, something that's very important to all of us right now is that AMA came out with a resolution this year uh, stating that the AMA believes racism is a threat to public health and that we need to uh, spend money uh, and uh, for pursuing health equity. That really came from some of the younger members of, of the uh, organization. So there might be a hierarchy, you know, in some areas within medicine, I don't say no, but a lot of these organizations really wanna hear your voice because they realize this is gonna be your career, your future, and you really do have a right to shape it uh, the way you, your conscience tells you it needs to go. There's healthy debate within these organizations and um, that's good, you know, diversity of ideas is good. But if you don't come to the table and you don't share your voice, then they don't know what it is that you wanna shape. So I would say uh, what Dr. Alvarez said is the power of your voice, believe in it, um, use your conscience, share it with, um, you know, one, one way to share it 
is within these organizations. And that's why I chose to be a part of the organizations. But I see with this excellent panel, there are many different ways um, to affect a change and be a, uh, an advocate. Um, I'll, I'll add to this. Um, I have a bit more of a cynical view on things, uh, to be honest. Um, I'm a part of some societies that, that I won't mention. And I can tell you that, that you know, it is still difficult sometimes in certain specialties, especially as you get into really niche specialties to really um, be strong in, in, in who you are and, and what, you're, what you're fighting for. Uh, medicine is still a very conservative um, uh, profession despite all of what you're seeing on social media. Um, you know, a lot of activism is performative to be, to be honest. And so um, time will tell uh, how, how sincere and how genuine these, these um, gestures are. Um, I think that it's wise to know the field you're going into, um, uh, do some reconnaissance, um, you know, but I do say to be more positive, uh, as, as, as house staff and as medical students, uh, you all have the most power um, because, you know, people don't care about what I say, but they definitely care about what medical students and residents are saying. Uh, because because so much is riding upon your experience, and there are eyes who are watching um, the things that medical students and um, residents report. So the GME and the ACGME are your friends, right? And so, if as a resident or a student you feel you are, you are being mistreated, like that is a great place to go because they will take your uh, concern seriously, even if your attending won't or your program director won't. Um, they will definitely hold people to task. And I think that, that as a resident and, and a fellow, I didn't utilize that resource um, as much as I should have. So I think that if that is a, still a concern of yours, um, you should definitely use that. Because even when I'm seeing on my end, um, as a, someone who teaches residents and students, um, you know, change is coming from, from that level, not from my level. Um, I can do some things, but the advocacy that takes place on those levels is, is amazing. And so even though I'm saying what I'm saying, you know, you can still, um, you know, feel protected by those organizations that have been designed to do that, which are the GME and the AC GME. I'll stop there. Thank you all for sharing. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Oh, Dr. Uh, Santiago. No, it's okay. <laughs> you can go ahead. <laughs> Do you have something to add on that? Well, so the, the only thing to, to add is, um, you know, one of the things that, that has been useful to the, or good for me is to, to have an employer to work uh, at an institution that values, you know, the the uh, the, the, the my, me and and also uh, the things that I'm interested in, and and helps me promote it. You know, so I, I'm very fortunate to have a CEO that uh, believes in the, the directions I want to take the organization. And uh, and lets me do that, so it's it's always good to to be in that kind of a situation. Thanks. Thank you for sharing. Um, so now we kind of want to know how you guys are able to balance your um, advocacy efforts with your uh, medical careers. I know that it's often linked, um, but how do you balance the two? Well, I, I feel I feel oftentimes like I'm cheating because, you know, my, it, it, it's basically what I do for a living and 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 I and I, I love what I do. So um, uh, sometimes I, I I feel I feel bad, you know, that that uh, it, it's all intertwined. Unlike some of you that that are, that are doing a lot of you know stuff on the side. So um, I, I'm very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that. You know, uh, I, I'm cheating in a way too. Um, you know, downstate is definitely a different, uh, uh, particularly when it comes to like places in the Northeast. Um, you know, we have a we have a place that's really focused on social justice and being involved in in, in the community, and so it's a little easier here. 
Um, I think that maybe then at some other institutions, that's just my opinion, that's not a fact. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that uh, that is true. However, I think that as clinicians, you know, the world is yours. You can craft any career for yourself that you want. You could be a dermatologist and be, you know, involved in advocacy. Um, you know, that's what I love about medicine so much is that as much as there's, you know, specialties and board exams and everything like that, um, you can still craft a career for yourself the way that you envision it. And, and, and once you open your mind up to, to, what's, to what's out there, uh, there's no limit to what you can do uh, to advocate for the population that you want to advocate for. Um, yeah, if I can just chime in. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah. So if I can um, chime in in terms of work balance, I had my son during the last year of training um, in my fellowship uh, year. He's now a college student, a junior, and he's been home for almost a year because of the pandemic. Um, and I really feel as a woman in medicine, because I was raising my son, I did have to take, back, take a step back in my role as an advocate because I chose the path of being in um, organized medicine. Uh, as, a, uh, as my avenue towards advocacy, but the world is so different now than it was 20 years ago. Now, when I go to the AMA, when I go to API, you know what, they have lactation rooms for uh, women who are breastfeeding. I see women coming into some of the uh, meetings with their, with their children. There's, um, there is a uh, babysitting available. There was one meeting where I had to, um, you know, bring my babysitter uh, to my meeting so that I could attend uh, the meetings um, as part of one of the organizations. But now uh, a lot of these organizations are providing um, babysitters. You might have to pay for it, but they're providing babysitters on site at the conferences to encourage women in medicine and young parents um, to be able to participate. So I, I think all of that has happened because younger people have joined the organization and saying, hey, if you want us to be involved early on in our careers, these are the things we need um, you know, to change so that we can uh, be a part of it. But I must say, when I was there 20 years ago, I didn't feel as if I had the support uh, for the first 10 years of my career to be both a parent and to uh, fly nationally, you know, six times a year to different meetings. It just wasn't possible for me to leave my young son at home. Um, I also feel maybe, you know, it, it affects your career. You can't do everything. Um, at the same time, or I didn't feel that way 20 years ago, but I feel that the world is changing in the right direction to try and get uh, uh, more younger people involved uh, in organized medicine. So I'm very happy about that. Yeah, and if I could talk to it, um, I had mentioned too, I had taken a year off to do yoga meditation and run a nonprofit yoga foundation. And so I should have some sort of work-life balance, right? Um, not to go very hippy dippy on everybody, but I've found that when you're on the right path in life, everything ends up working out and coming together. Um, and I've seen that through my advocacy pathway in terms of, I do take on a lot, um, but it's now actually kind of the main focus of my job. And that's really too what, it, what I spend a lot of my time on um, similar to Dr. Santiago, you know, I almost feel like I'm cheating the system because I enjoy this so much. Um, and I actually, to Dr. Shah's point about how there are different avenues for which you can pursue, um, you know, I'm getting my executive MBA now because what I realized as a resident in doing contract negotiations for other residents around the country and different aspects of hospital administration was there weren't physicians in those roles, you know, doing the hospital administration work. And there are people making decisions who have never done any clinical work and they are bankers and they are fantastic bankers and lawyers and accountants, but they don't know what you know and they don't have an understanding of how the medical system works. And so um, I'm getting my MBA now and I had a few people kind of be like, why are you doing that? Like, why aren't you getting a master's in public policy? And I was like, because this is how you make the change. You have to be the seat at the table to be able to enact change, to have that conversation. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily have to be the traditional advocacy routes that you think of, like really explore what's out there to find how you can make that part of your advocacy work. 
thank you so much for your answers. And we just have an additional question asking, how did being a Sophie Davis graduate influence the position that you have become? I'll start that one because I, I guess I'm the soonest from the graduation point, but I would not be anywhere close to the position I am today without Sophie Davis. And it's not, Sophie Davis has so many layers to it that it's not only the group of students who you're with, right? Because you guys are all there for a common mission. You have a common understanding, but the faculty there, the level of mentorship that I've had from Sophie Davis, um, I still speak with Dr. Kashfi pretty frequently. I talk to Dr. Dean pretty frequently. Those are connections that I'm so thankful to have and really shaped me. And I, I will say too that Sophie Davis gave me the support and the, the freedom and really the, the confidence to know that I was on the right path in medicine. I mean, I probably looked like a crazy person taking a year off of medical school to study yoga. And actually the new physician, AMSA's magazine wrote about me doing it. But I had that support of Sophie Davis and I had um, all of these aspects really making me understand what it means to be a doctor. Um, you guys almost are lucky in the sense that um, all of us had to go to another medical school for our last two years. And when you meet your other classmates, they're fantastic, but they're so green in terms of understanding the world and understanding what patients actually have to go through. And you are so well seasoned for that, um, that you're gonna, excuse my language, kick ass when you get out there. I mean, I guess I could be second unless we want to go in in order of uh, graduation date, in which case I'd be, I think, last amongst the group. So no, you're yeah. second by graduation date. What are you next? <laughs> <after shop? laughs> so I'll just kind of like, you know, stick my way in the middle. This be, no one figures it out. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think I, I've been talking about it the whole hour that we spent together is how important the training in Sophie Davis um, is. One is, um, you know, like you said, we went to, I went to another medical school for my third and fourth year, and we were rock solid. Our educational background was rock solid. But beyond that, we had an understanding of the larger world of medicine, um, our responsibility to understand our, our patients, families, and communities. That was a very important um, teaching that Sophie Davis gave me. Uh, as, a, as, as a social determiner of health, we talk about that, but you know, Sophie Davis actually taught us that and we spent a whole summer exploring that in the different communities that we were sent out to. Um, also, Sophie Davis had, uh, I don't know how we found time, but we had time to be a part of AMSA and I, and I think everyone should be a part of AMSA because it really just, uh, you know, gives you an opportunity uh, to, to be uh, uh, aware of, of what's going on in the world and Sophie Davis supports that. So I, I think having uh, graduated from Sophie Davis, you know, I, I think I would have been a different uh, person if I hadn't uh, graduated from Sophie Davis. I guess I'll go next. So I, I concur, you know, I think that being at Sophie, you know, you become, it is, it is almost intuitive or, or second nature to think about the larger community and, and the context for your patient interaction. I think that that's the, that's one of the biggest um, benefits of going to Sophie because you get that exposure so early and, and, it, and it's so early, it's almost second nature to you to look at things you know, a bit differently than your, you know, than your peers will. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, you may not see this until maybe you get to residency. Uh, but for those of us who had to transition at the third and fourth year, it was immediately obvious that, you know, your training uh, about the holistic approach to patient care was so much more advanced, uh, you, know, you know, than your colleagues. And I think that that was the lasting impact of Sophie uh, on my career. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. I was listening to Dr. Alvarez talk about how it's, it's, it's nice uh, in life when things kind of fall in place. And, you know, it's, uh, when I moved to, to Miami, I, I joined uh, an HIV practice um, in 1994. Of course, that's when 
you know, everybody was uh, dying from HIV that had it. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I joined an organization that, uh, you know, was an aid service organization. Still, I, you know, I didn't think that I would be caring for the, you know, the wider population. It was very LGBT focused. Um, then in 1999, when we decided to, actually the board of directors decided uh, we would become a, a, a federally qualified health center. I was, I was thinking to myself, my God, do I, that's not what I signed up for. I just wanted to, to just keep doing what I was doing. And it's just funny how life just uh, throws things at you. And, and that was good. It's, it's been a lot of work. Uh, it, you know, it, it's not easy to be an FQHC and, and, and to maintain the quality that you're required to, to, to have. But, you know, I don't think that I could have done it if it wasn't for the training that I had, you know, at, at Sophie Davis. And, uh, you know, I was very saddened, to, you know, to hear that uh, Dr. Geiger had died and I still remembered him from, from my uh, courses there. Um, there's no question, question that, that, it, that if not for Sophie Davis, you know, I wouldn't have been able to, to do what I've done, uh, you know, now as chief medical officer of this, you know, foresight of QHC. So thank you to all of our alumni for their wonderful responses. I know I felt inspired by each of your stories. So now I would like to open the floor up to anyone in the audience that would like to ask any additional questions. Uh, so I do wanna ask a question. And since I feel like my question is pretty long and two-parted. Um, I kind of wanted to preface it and then I'll just put the question in chat because I'm telling you it's a two-parted long question. Um, but each and every one of you speaking here did um, inspire me because I know Dr. Santiago you talked about like burnout and Dr. Alvarez you talked about like standing up against opposing views and Dr. Gisi talked about violence in your community which I've experienced literally outside of my window hearing things at two in the morning when you're trying to like study for an exam. Um, Dr. Shaw, you talked about like being there before and as times are changing. And so it's really evident that like advocacy work is really tiring. Like it's really tiring, even though it could be fulfilling, it's super tiring. <laughs> um, and even though like we're already, we're only in medical school and a lot of people are like engaging in this, especially like with a summer like this and even before the summer, cause a lot of times people like to jump on things when there's momentum and not <laughs> before, um, you know? And then you're just like, well, it's glad we have like people now, but are you gonna like maintain and stay on? Um, but to maintain and stay on, you have to be in the mental space to do that. So here's my question, two part. Um, <laughs> how do you um, care for yourself so that you don't burn out? And then the second part is what advice would you give medical students who have to take exams, have to focus on classes while their community is hurt, hurting? Um, so I'm gonna put that into the chat. And like, when I say hurting, it's very vague, but like personally for me, um, in just a span of two, two like months or three months, like two people got gunned down outside of my home and you have police knocking on my door and I'm like studying and all that stuff. You have people who are, a lot of people are dying from COVID and you know, black and brown people are experiencing this at disproportion disproportional rates. All of these statistics, you know, you know. So how do you yourself like not burn out and what advice would you give medical students how to focus or what to do when the communities are hurting? Um, I think I'll start by, by taking that question. So I think that, you know, as a student, uh, you know, this may sound a little bit selfish and, and there may be some differences in, in opinion uh, from the other speakers, but the number one investment you can make is into yourself. And I, and I think that, you know, to get, the, to get to where the speakers are at this, on this platform, you know, there was a time for activism and then there was a time for, for studying. And at the end of the day, if, if you don't prioritize um, academic excellence and, you know, you go too hard in the activism space, um, not only will you burn out early, but you won't even make it to the level where you can do things that like, you know, Dr. Alvarez is doing, you know. So I think it's very important to have protected space, protected time for your education and for your own 
personal growth and development. You know, all of you all are still growing and coming into, into yourselves and who you are and what you want to do. And you have, you have to leave time for that. Another thing that I, I feel is that, you know, we feel this urge to take, take it on ourselves and bear the weight. And sometimes you'll find that, you know, when you bear the weight and then you get that bad test grade, you're the one who has to deal with that bad test grade. There's no one else to deal with it, you know, you know, but you. So, you know, look for allies, you know, in your fight, you know, and, and especially for, you know, for, for Black and Latin folks who have been historically um, affected by these events, you know, it's not our job to tear these systems down, you know, it's the job of those who built these systems, you know, uh, to tear them down. So also remember that, you know, make time for yourself, make time for your growth, and make time for your healing. And make time for activism, but don't let it consume you uh, because we want you to be uh, the best version of yourself. And in this space, this may mean, this may mean being the medical director for uh, uh, FQHC, you know, you know in, in, in Florida. You know? So and then at that level, then you're really, you're really impacting so many more lives. So make time for yourself and your, your growth and development. Yeah, very well said. I mean, I, I must say that I, I, I would agree with you. Before you advocate for someone uh, else, you need to advocate for yourself and, and take care of yourself, make priorities, as you said, um, and be kind to yourself. Uh, figure out you know, what you need to do to get to where you want to go and how much time you have for other things, and then shed the guilt. You can't, you can't do everything all the time. Um, you know, as I said, the first 10 years of my career is when I was raising my son. Those were 10 very important years for me. I wanted to be a good physician, but I also wanted to be a good mother. And so my advocacy work did have to go, you know, um, be put somewhat uh, on the side. But hey, you know, the past 10 years, my son's been independently going to school. He doesn't need me to babysit him anymore. And now's the time I can go on trips, um, you know, and interact with my colleagues nationally and internationally uh, and have my voice heard. Um, also, you know, while advocacy feels like work, I think oh, we've heard a couple of the speakers say that they feel like they're cheating the system because it's it's a part of who they are. So I I, I also don't feel a, a, feel it's work. It's kind of uh, part of the fiber of who you are. And if it works well with with your work environment and you're able to advocate in your work, then it doesn't take time away. It's synergistic. So I would try and find a career that matches, get to the state where you're done with your residency, you get your boards, and then also find a way um, to find a career that's supportive of the advocacy efforts that you dream of wanting to do. Um, so that you're not against, you know, you wanna do one thing, but you're not in a supportive environment. Find an environment that's supportive. And you do that by, um, you know, reaching out to different people, coming to seminars like this and hearing what's out there. So uh, keep your ears open. Um, and then the first thing is just take care of yourself. You know, stress is a real thing. I know that AMA and all the organizations have really put an emphasis on, on uh, the stresses that physicians uh, have even before the pandemic. And there are even, uh, even more now with, with the pandemic and with the political uh, climate. So make sure you take care of yourself uh, and do not be afraid to ask for help if you need it. That's a sign in my eyes and everyone's eyes of strength. If you're asking for help, you're not weak. That's a sign of strength. If you need help, go, um, you know, um, ask for it. Um. Great. Yes. No. For, uh, for for sure. You know, it's it's interesting because um, if if I could go back in time, uh, you know, to when I was a, a first a student at Sophie Davis, uh, I definitely would tell myself to take more time for myself. You know, I, I definitely was was an overachiever, you know, always. And, um, and I remember my first semester taking the 21 credits that I was taking, uh, you know, we took human anatomy right out of high school. And I, I remember not doing anything social that first semester at all. You know, I didn't even go see a movie. I specifically remember that. And, uh, you know, it, through my career, it's, it's been, you know, I go through these, uh, through, through these phases where like, you know, for a few years, I go through a few years where like, I just keep building and adding more and more responsibility, you know, to my plate. And then I say, okay, this is too much. And then I, and then I, I, I back up a little bit and that'll last for a couple of years and it usually always goes back up again. And, uh, 
you know, more most recently, you know, with with COVID last year, it just got insane. Of course, that that just consumed, you know, administratively everything that 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 we had to do to to you know just provide care for our patients, implement new policies and procedures, and all of that. And um and you know, the good thing that came out of this is just you know I said okay, I have to pl- I have to place limits because I felt myself really getting burnt out. And uh, you know, I think that's probably thirty percent or more of of uh, physicians feel that way. Uh, are experiencing uh, burnout. And so, you know, they definitely came to a head last year and I said, okay, no, I have to, to back up. I, 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 I'm very careful, to, you know, to, to block my time. You know, I stop working at a certain time, you know, because it's, it's certainly easy, you know, you're, you're working from home a lot of times, you know, and, but I had to, you know, say, okay, enough is enough. I, I set the limits and, you know, I'm, I'm much in a much better place now. You know, it's really important to make sure you take time to be with family uh, and friends. Um, and to, you know, self-care is really, you know, can't, can't be understated. It's, it's really important to, to take the time you're important. Um, you know, the other things can wait, even if it's just watching Netflix, you know, I, you know, it took me a while to get over the guilt of, of doing brainless things like watching Netflix and Hulu. And, uh, you know, I'm finally able to, to really enjoy it sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I very much so agree <laughs> with the sentiments of Dr. Santiago. And sometimes I have to almost keep myself from taking on too much. And I, it's a new muscle I've been trying to flex is being aware of when I feel like it's, we're gonna be too much. Um, and that's really hard to do, especially with when I am passionate about things and I, I wanna be in. Um, but you, just to Dr. Just point, you can't do all of those things if you aren't taking care of you. Um, and so it's, it's always important to, to take some time, especially when you're, you're feeling that, to, to do whatever you feel is beneficial for you at that time. And especially with everything going on with COVID, are the racial injustices that have been happening throughout the course of the year, let alone um, for years, the political unrest, it is really overwhelming. Um, and I find myself that when I need to take a break, I take that break and I do, I take like an emotional break, right? If I feel like I need to cry, like that's totally okay, I will ugly cry and that's fine, I, I get it out. If I feel like I need to laugh, I put something really dumb on YouTube on and I take those five minutes to get to the point where I have stuff coming out of my nose laughing. And you want to try to have those emotions to get it out so you can refocus and recenter yourself. And it's totally okay. Another one too, when I'm angry, and I used to do it more so before COVID, but you're able to buy like really, really cheap glass from the dollar store that isn't even really glass. And so I would go to the rooftop of my building and if I was really, really angry and I would have basically a bag of glass that I bought for eight to ten dollars and I would just smash it and it just letting out all of those emotions of just how I feel um, really really kind of helps center you and yeah you look kind of ridiculous but who cares you're doing it for you right um, so if you take that mentality and find those little things for you it really helps okay uh, so thank you to our panelists um on that question. So we have one last question for the panelists, uh, which is, can you name some organizations medical students can join or specific examples of how we can get involved in medical advocacy as students? So one thing is, one, find what you're passionate about. Um, Kind of span the gamut of what's out there, what is really driving you. But two, as a medical student, you, um, and I know Dr. Shah had mentioned this as well, I was doing a lot of um, article writing and op-ed pieces uh, during my time at Sophie Davis, particularly too on what we were learning and then applying it to the political landscape. Um, And so it's a really great time to try to get out that information. Um, There are lots of resources for medical students. And again, too, it's it's really finding what you are passionate about. And there are medical related organizations. And then there are organizations that would be so happy to have you as a medical student. 
that may not necessarily be medically based. And so not to kind of just limit it to the scope of, of medical organizations, um, but think about how you can even span your impact with your medical knowledge in other organizations. Um, I'm not sure if, yeah, so as Dr. Alvarez said, there are so many groups out there um, that, you, that you can uh, volunteer for, but I'm going to not answer your question. Uh, <laughs> sorry, but I want to just say this, you know, if you're going to be an advocate, I would say whatever group you're going to um, do this work for or with, um, make sure you are informed about that group, especially if you're not of that group. Um, make sure you're doing the, the legwork first so that you're not in a space where you're actually being um, hurtful and causing uh, you know, more trauma uh, in that space. I think it's very, very important. A lot of times doctors, um, we have a, you know, this like colonist mindset where we're going to just go in and make everything better. Um, but there's a lot that we don't understand. So I would just say to anyone that's going to you know, join a group or you know maybe even go out on your own. Um, please do the homework you know on yourself. Um, yourself uh, be credible uh, and don't re-traumatize uh, you know the community. You know I mentioned at, in my um, introduction about trauma-informed care, restorative justice, and being a, being a credible messenger. And those aren't just throwaway terms. Those are terms that you should always understand when you're going into any community and you're trying to provide you know a service. Uh, so there's more of information out there about the work that you can do, but, you know, really inform yourself and try not to, you know, repeat the mistakes of those who may have come before us in the name of doing good. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll go next. Yeah, so I've already spoken a lot about the organizations I'm involved with. I think most of them are more than happy and actually eager to have medical students. Sorry, they often don't even charge for membership fees for medical students and possibly for residents, it might be a, a nominal fee. So actually getting involved with a uh, um, with these organizations, you know, I'm familiar with the American Medical Association, but if you think you want to go into internal medicine, you know, uh, you might be able to join the National Internal Medicine Association, or if you want, if you know what, what areas you want to go into um, that you're interested in, and you could, you know, go there uh, and, and look for the organizations. And a lot of them have medical student uh, sections that you could join um, for no, you know, for nothing um, or nominal fee. Uh, also, I would just suggest you you enjoy what you're doing. Most of advocacy work is free, so you really gotta see you know what uh, what makes you happy. Uh, I think all of us are doing this because there's some part of us that's fulfilled or happy in doing this. So kind of you know uh, uh, make sure that wherever you, um, you're involved in that that's really something that drives you, motivates you. You're learning from it. You're teaching someone from it. Um, you know, uh, and then then it'll be a, a, a very good uh, exchange. But um, so I would highly recommend even now uh, joining the American Medical Association if, if all of you haven't. Um, it's a great, um, you know, uh, organization that uh, one of the courses I took uh, as part of their um, part of the American Medical Association is about politics and running a campaign. And the AMA had a, a whole weekend course on uh, on uh, running your own political campaign. Well, you know, until you're part of the AMA, you wouldn't even know that that kind of resource is available to you. Another organization, the Indian Physician Organization, uh, went on a trip to Antarctica in November of 2019. And I volunteered to talk about breast cancer screening and lung cancer screening and, and, and was able to go to Antarctica. Uh, so, you know, kind of uh, uh, um, see what excites you, you know, and explore. Yeah, I think that you're you're very fortunate nowadays that you can just uh, Google whatever it is that you're interested in and find, you know, uh, associations you may be able to work for. I mean, I remember when I was a medical student, uh, uh, I didn't have a personal computer. My father had a Commodore 64, <laughs> and uh, we certainly, I certainly didn't even have a personal computer until 1994. 
Um, so, so that's definitely in, in your favor. I, you know, I can tell you that, that if you're interested in LGBT issues, there's the Gay Medical Student Association. Um, there's the American Association of HIV Medicine if you're interested in HIV care, which uh, you know, we definitely are gonna be having a, a shortage of HIV specialists uh, in, in the near future as people retire. Um, but it's, it's, it's the most important thing is for you to, to uh, be interested and you seem like a, a great group of advocates um, I admire you for taking the time to, to, to be part of the American Medical Student Association and, and also for, you know, to put this together. This is, this is really heartwarming uh, to be part of. So congratulations. Congratulations, everyone did a, a great job and it's been a, a lot of fun to be learning from all the other panelists for myself, you know, to learn uh, what all the wonderful uh, co-panelists are doing. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you to you. Oh. oh no, I was just going to say thank you too. <laughs> I'm sorry, Leela, but just no, no, thank no. you too. And just it's really humbling to be. Sophie Davis is always family, and you'll always feel that as part of Sophie Davis. And so it's humbling to be around such an amazing group of co-panelists, and it's so exciting to see just the interest of all of the Sophie Davis students now too. That's so nice to hear. <laughs> Um, well, thank you to our guests, Dr. Santiago, Dr. Shah, Dr. Gist, and Dr. Alvarez for joining us. Um, it's nice to see how many options, like so many options there are for us to pursue advocacy. And I'm sure um, a lot of my fellow classmates are, are feeling excited to start our own journeys. Um, so I, I, I think each of our guests put their information in the chat so if you have any additional questions because I know like we could keep going on talking but I don't want to um you know step too far into your night um you can reach out to them um but we also wanted to thank Margaret for helping us out with um contacting our alumni we couldn't have done that without her um and lastly on Sundays another Sophie Davis alumni has alum has her podcast. Um, I'll put the link in, in, in the chat, but uh, this week's theme is medical school and activism. So um, I thought it might be a good idea to, to just add that in there. Um, and if you're inter interested in joining, um, I'll, I'll put the information in the chat. Um, but thank you to the to everyone else, faculty, staff, we got a lot of, oh, her name is Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'll, I'll put it all in there. Um, but yeah, thank you to all of all the students, faculty and staff um, for coming. And I hope you have a good night. Thank you, good night everyone. Oh, and yeah, thank you so much. Good night everyone, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> all the best. Okay, good night, best wishes, yeah. Hey guys, thank you and good luck with everything. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for coming.